Uh, welcome back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more importantly, it's History Lens with John David Ann of HBU, a history professor. Today, we're going to talk about the 2008 Great Recession. Lots to discuss on that because it has cast right. a shadow on American history. And the question, you know, however related or unrelated, about inequality and including disparity of wealth. John, welcome right. back to the show. Hey, thanks very much. Great to be here. How are you doing, Jay? I'm good. So let's yeah. see. 2008, yeah. the Great Recession is something that I think about all the time because I keep <laughs> looking for indicia, okay. you know, that are left behind, left behind uh -huh. what was it? going to be yeah. a great recession. Right. And, right. and now right. we hear from the White House that everything is just fine. So can right. you talk about the, right. you know, the causes and effects of the great right. recession right. of 2008? Okay, so we had this terrible recession. We call it a great recession because honestly, it was like a great depression, only it was only a recession. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. Of course. <laughs> That's of that for circular reasoning. Anyway, so in the Great Recession, we had a terrible downturn in the economy. I mean, the, the housing market dropped by 30 percent. Sometimes in some areas of the country, it dropped by 50 percent. Uh, we had uh, 10 percent unemployment. Uh, we had parts of the country that suffered from uh, e the kind of the recession until 2016. Even during the election of 2016, we think that the three states that Trump really needed to win, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, those states were actually in a, still in a kind of mini recession left over from the Great Recession. So the, the impact of this Great Recession was tremendous. Um, we had, uh, you know, an entire generation of young people who were kind of cut out of uh, owning a home uh, in the cities. The home ownership rates dropped under, under 50%. So it was this enormous cataclysm. Didn't go into a Great Depression, I think, simply because the government acted quickly and made some pretty significant investments. You know, the uh, the Obama plan to uh, to bail out uh, uh, corporations and then the stimulus package. Those two things prevented a Great Depression mm -hmm. and prevented this kind of uh, this thing going going really global and and destroying the world economy but in some ways we were in worse shape in 2008 than we were in the great depression the amount of indebtedness corporate indebtedness was actually far more than it was during the great depression uh and and so the potential was there for this thing to really unravel the other thing of course that happened is the commercial paper markets froze up during the great Dep during the great recession uh, there, there really wasn't such a thing, at least not on a wide scale in the 1930s, but uh, with, with the corporation with so much debt and with credit markets seizing up, then we were really, we could have been a couple months away from, from a, a kind of uh, an economic winter in, in the globe, which would have lasted a lot longer and been much more devastating. So there were was. some abuses, there were some practices and there was some, uh, you know, phenomena that were happening up to the 2008 debacle. Uh, right, right. And, and right, the very right. people who, uh, you know, wanted a bailout in 2008 were the people that created those problems. Can you talk about it? That's, that's true, right. So, so, so this is really, in some ways, the Great Recession is about banks. It's about the banking industry and and these bad practices of banks. So if we, we look at the, the causes or, you know, why did this thing happen? Then one of the reasons why is because the bank started doing things that were quite risky. And if we start with mortgages, this is the beginning of the story really, because when, when George W. Bush won election in 2000, in the year 2000, and then won re-election in 2004, his idea was to grant uh, people who had never owned homes before to, to get them into home ownership and expand the level of home ownership to heights unseen. Why am I and, reminded of a chicken in every pot? <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> Everybody gets a home, no matter whether that person can afford it or not. <laughs> right. That's right. A chicken in every pot. Right before the Great Depression, of course, Herbert Hoover in his inaugural talked about a chicken in every pot <laughs> in 1929. And then, you know, months later, the economy crashed. So, <laughs> beware of politicians. <laughs> that's, that's one of the takeaways. So, 
No, these, so the, the banking industry got into some real questionable practices with mortgages and they started, first of all, they started giving mortgages to people who really shouldn't have a mortgage. Uh, these, these first mortgages were called NINA mortgages because it, that's, that's an acronym that stands for no income and no assets. <laughs> and yet these banks began to give these folks who were NINAs mortgages. It's kind of astonishing. And then we move on from Ninas to ninjas, and that's no income, no job, and no assets. Well, so that's... you know, if a bank gave a mortgage, and I these were not, uh, well, you have to tell me, but um, I don't yeah. think these were all government secured, government guaranteed mortgages. But if a bank gave a mortgage like that, what in the world did it think would happen? This is against all the banking rules that you always hear about. Right. Right. So, okay. So, Part of it is that bankers were just doing innovations, right? They were, I think they, in some ways they were trying to fulfill Bush's pledge. And, uh, and, and when, so the way this happens is that the guy on the ground is got a chance to sign up a lot more people to a mortgage, right? The mortgage broker is the guy on the ground. And so he likes the Nina in the, the Ninja. So, so he's doing all of this. And then what happens is the banks think they can handle these types of mortgages because these mortgages will actually be uh, what, what, what the banks do is they take these mortgages and they sell them. And in the process, they bundle them with lots of other mortgages that are actually good mortgages. And so therefore you have what are called a, a, a collateralized debt obligation. And, and the banks were doing this wide scale with, millions actually trillions of dollars in in mortgage uh and so they, they so they so so they there there were some people at the banks who actually understood that this was very risky but i think most people involved in this just thought hey this is a way for me to make more money and and you know and these these things probably won't work but it's small part of this and no problems now when we come to when we look at you know let's go, of course there were entities regulating the banks, why didn't they catch this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is that these, uh, these entities regulating the banks, uh, the, first of all, the credit rating agencies, right? Standard and Poor's, Moody's and Fitch's, right? Those agencies were looking at these big, what were called tranches of, of collateralized de debt obligation, these mortgages packaged together and all they saw was the good mortgages. They looked at like the top three or 4% of them and those were good. What they didn't know is underneath it, 97% of these mortgages were starting to go bad. So, so they that's had a the flawed first... system for reviewing the mortgages then. They well, were right. not looking at a, a good sample of the mortgages and certainly not looking at all of them. Exactly, they weren't going back in history. It's also true that the banks pay the credit rating agencies to get a rating uh, this creates a pretty strong incentive on the part of the credit rating agencies to actually, you know, boost up the, the, the credit or the, the rating of a particular, uh, you know, a particular bundle of mortgages. So, so you had all kinds of problems. The other problem you have is there was a government office doing this regulation of the banks. It was called the Office of Thrift Supervision. And we have a picture there, if, if Eric can pull up the picture of these executives from that office and they're they're actually there it is right so this this is this is at a conference of the office of uh, that the office of thrift supervision held and and these are all these regulations that they're saying they have to cut through well in you know the chainsaw it was very dramatic you know everybody loved this this was a time period of deregulation but the truth is this office fell down on the job of regulating these banks because they didn't know any of this. They, they might have known they didn't do much of a job saying, hey, you got to stop these uh, offering these questionable mortgages. And then the way that these mortgages were put into these uh, debt obligations. And so the debt obligations become a source of investment then. And mm -hmm. that's how the contagion really spreads because mm -hmm. it's one thing to have these these uh, these mortgages that are bad, but it's another thing if you're selling them and then reselling them and reselling them, and that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, well, so you know, I, what I get out of this is that there's a certain culture developed uh, under George Bush, um, or maybe even before yeah. George Bush, 
in terms of let's let's have everybody uh, take a mortgage out, even those who shouldn't. And let's kind of yep. try to cover that up by including it in a larger group of mortgages. And uh, yep. we'll, we'll, we'll sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll bury it in a, in a crowd of bad mortgages. We're, you know, it's right. like um, you, you make it up in volume, even though you know there's some bad ones in there. Yep. Then you have people yep. who give bad opinions about it, who don't follow generally accepted accounting principles, who don't right. follow right. traditional banking standards. <laughs> and at the end of the day, back in 2008, all those things had fallen away. And just like 29, right. we were living on vapor, on fumes, yeah. and it was bound yeah. to crash. Right, right. Yeah, there was a lot of <clears throat> what we call water in the marketplace. And and there was a lot, of, a lot of these banks were selling this water and other banks were buying the water. The thing is you have, what you have in the early 2000s is, this enormous increase in the giant pool of money. The global pool of money stands at about $35 trillion in the year 2000. And by 2007, that global pool of money has increased to $70 trillion. It doubles wow. in a span of seven years. And this is really the work of the, of the Chinese economy and the Indian economy, you know, just growing at very rapid rates. These guys have a lot of money that they want to they want to invest, right? And these these mortgage bundles they look pretty good. They're what they're highly rated by the credit agencies, so they they buy them. The Chinese actually do a lot of buying through Europe, through London, uh, and then American banks get into this and they're selling this. And so yeah, it's it's very dangerous because once the once the mortgages fail, then what you have is this trail of companies that lose money. You know, you have the bank that issued the mortgage and then you have the, the one that bought the mortgage. And so it's, you have this kind of uh, uh, this multiplier effect. So now the other thing that happens is that uh, the banks get into another very risky business, which is called credit default swaps. And these are essentially bets. These are hedges that you take on a uh, on a company that you've done business miss, business with. Mostly this is like. If your company decides to buy a bond, let's say, of another entity, and you know you okay, you bought their bond and you think it's going to be okay, but you're not 100% sure, you want to hedge that risk, you go and buy a credit default swap that actually gives you money if that bond fails, if the company fails. So you're buying, you're betting both in favor and against at the same time. And uh, there was a lot of this going on. This is the AIG story, right? This is in. 2008, when when it, when you know Bear Stearns collapsed and Lehman Brothers, and then a, and uh, Bear Stearns was uh, you know salvaged actually. Lehman Brothers just was simply closed, but AIG is the largest uh, commercial insurer in the world, and they had credit default swaps of over 400 billion dollars, and their entire equity was at a hundred billion dollars. So. They were way over leveraged in case the economy went bad. And this they were, is they were too big to fail, right? The old too big to fail. And in fact, they, they didn't, they, they managed to avoid failing and they changed their name. Right. What, what are they called now? Oh, I, I'm not sure of the name. I mean, you can still I find think it's them. Farmers. I think Farmers is the new name for yeah. AIG. You can still find them under AIG on the internet. But right, so what happens then is, so you've got this situation that just, the. The, the housing market failures are happening in 2006 and 2007. So you've got that early on. But then as they accumulate and then these mortgages begin to fail, then by, by mid-2008, there are a lot of warning signs. The housing market is actually in a downturn in the United States at that point. So that's really, we're, we're in a housing recession by mid-2008. And then you have these investment collapses and everybody's invested in everybody else, especially with these credit default swaps. So you have some major brokerages fail. You have a mutual fund that fails, puts a lot of investors at risk. And then AIG uh, is on the ropes. They've got to pay, you know, out of their equity of 100 billion, they have to pay 400 billion in, in credit default swaps. And so they're looking to fail. And that's when the government steps in and begins to uh, to back up these these entities, and that's probably what you're referring to when we talk about too big to fail, and then the bad guys getting a good deal, the guys who actually created this re recession actually getting a bailout. This happens with AIG to probably the biggest extent. 
but it also happens with other banks. Um, I mean, it's 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 like a fire patrol, quite frankly. And in, in from September 2008, the government is really less worried about the fairness of it. They're worried about the entire economy collapsing. So we do uh, have. And they didn't really do a job at, at prosecuting people who should have been prosecuted um, right. and, and calling it out against people who who should have been called out. I remember a movie, I think it was called No Way Out, done by Charles Ferguson a brilliant documentarian, and he was really okay. good at interview. And he had the dean of the Harvard Business School on there. And he said, oh, yeah. Dean, you know, I understand the day before Lehman Brothers failed, uh, you, you gave them a letter telling them they were class A, they were in good shape. Um, and uh, did you, what kind of research did you do for that letter? Well, that was a muffled answer. And, and the day after, the day after you gave them that letter saying they were in good shape, they failed. Can you explain that? And, and, you know, and the conversation <laughs> trailed off from oh. there. <laughs> it was a brilliant movie. Um, yeah, that, we can talk yeah, about so. that movie. But, you know, the right. uh, talk about movies, John. The upshot was a guy named Cyrus Vance. Uh, he was oh, the yeah. district attorney. He still is a district attorney of Manhattan. Right. He, yeah. And uh, yeah. he he's the one prosecutor who prosecuted anybody right. in, in, right. as a result of the 2008 um you know, debacle. And it was a Chinese bank in Chinatown. It was a movie made, a documentary movie made about this bank. Uh, and it was a little wee tiny bank, a family bank in Chinatown. So you have all yeah. these huge, big, multi-billion, trillion dollar banks. Right. They didn't get right. prosecuted. Right. Nobody got prosecuted. Right. These few guys right. in Chinatown. Get pre and by the way, the Chinese right. guys so won the case. Yeah. <laughs> and Cyrus Vance yeah. failed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is an issue. I mean, one person who went went to jail, right? You know, there were very few prosecutions, and I I do think that the the too big to fail phenomenon was there. It was on the minds of you know of the federal government when they were looking at this situation. One thing that Obama said is that the problem is so many regulations were uh, abandoned in the late '90s and the early 2000s that the, the laws by which you could prosecute these wrongdoers were actually gone. They were off the mm, books. Interesting. So, actually, yeah. so it was very difficult to prosecute them. But it brings to mind, I mean, your point about the too big to fail brings to mind the question of why in the 1930s during the Great Depression, was that a time period when, when uh, the United States became a place where it became more equal, where inequality was reduced because, well, because of several things, but after the 2008 Great Recession, then inequality was not reduced, but it was in fact exacerbated. And I think you've touched upon one of the answers to that, uh, the too big to fail phenomenon and the unwillingness of the government to, to really confront these wrongdoers in a way that would take them down, maybe take the banks down, but maybe could do real damage to the American economy. Maybe they should have, maybe they should have taken down, you know, Wells Fargo and and uh, you know these other banks that's you know th that were uh, uh, that were just right front and center in this and were yeah. some of the wrong. Yeah. Well, all that considered, John, it sounds to me yeah. like well, you know, inherent in what you're saying is uh, this could happen again. This this very oh, yeah. set of circumstances could reappear, yeah. and the same thing could happen. And and what's interesting, and you have to, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure of this, but I do recall. That in the end, all the money that Obama gave those banks, the bailout money, was billions and right. billions of dollars. Um, yeah. It wasn't all repaid. Some of them, which are still in business, have not repaid those monies. Okay, so in the case of the bailout, actually, the bailout actually made the taxpayers money. They 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 pushed out about uh, it was like four hundred thirty-eight billion dollars, and they got back about. Uh, 450 billion dollars, 445, something like that. So, so they actually did make a little money on the on the bailout. So, because because the quite frankly, a lot of these businesses they were concerned about their image in the marketplace, and so they they worked very quickly and diligently to pay back their loans. Uh, but you know, so so that part of it actually worked, and that's actually a misperception, a public misperception, is that this. The, the TARP or the, you know, the bailout money didn't actually do anything. It did actually save the economy that way. Well, that, but, you know, well, go to misperception for a minute, John. One other point I would really like you to talk about is, is the public reaction to all of this. 
You know, if I'm right. an ordinary guy right. on the street, I say to myself, how could the government let this happen? The government was right. complicit in the problem, maybe primary right. in the problem. Right. And the government was primary in letting these guys off the hook. And the government was primary in spending all our money to bail them out. And the government yeah. never did anything, um, you know, <laughs> and, and left and left the field just sort of as it was. How can yeah. I be confident in government? Yeah. And, I, and I, my question to you is, okay. isn't it true that the yeah. uh, Great Recession of 2008 was just another straw that broke the government's image in the mind of the of the citizen and taxpayer. Yeah, you know, I, I think so. Yeah, this this issue of perceptions is very important. And I think the fact that the government didn't go after more of these wrongdoers really hurt the government's image. I, I'm, I think you're absolutely right, Jay, that uh, that in the long run, this what it did is it increased American cynicism about government. Um, you, you helped the you know, the, the guy who's getting a golden parachute, you know, millions of dollars for him to step down from his position. And then the, us, the, the small guys who are losing our homes, you're not giving us enough help. So you had a definite uh, perception problem there. And the way it worked politically is, you know, it should have worked for the Democrats' advantage, quite frankly. It should have moved people into the Democratic category. But I think here's where Obama... President Obama bears some responsibility because he wanted to be a fixer, right? He wanted to fix the divide between the parties, but this was not the right time to be taking that kind of approach. This was a time where you really needed to take uh, cons the, the conservative approach, the kind of the free market deregulation approach, which was being pushed by Republicans. You, ne you needed to take those guys to task for having created this problem. So mm -hmm. I, I do think uh, that hurt. And I think that's part of why we have the kind of the political cycle that we're in right now is Trump was actually able to use the, the results of the 2008 recession and the fact that there are some areas that are still hurting mm -hmm. to his advantage, even though he's from the party that actually caused this or, or primarily caused this. Well, can you I mean, connect not... that up with the subject we were also gonna discuss? And that is inequality right. and disparity. How right. does that relate to the, the recession and what happened after? Right. So in real economic terms, the thing is, it's, it wasn't just a great recession, but in real economic terms, the middle class has not been growing in terms of its income for a long time. It's been since, since the late 80s that the middle class in this country has actually seen a, a significant growth in its income. I mean, in the period before from the 1950s to the 1970s, the working class really gained, and the middle class did too. Working class incomes went up almost, uh, almost 100 percent in that 20-year period. But in recent years, and you see this, uh, you see this, uh, this graph up there right now. In recent years, here's the the household income by rank, and you see that those at the very top, their incomes have grown almost 400 percent in recent years, whereas middle class people are pretty flat, and actually. In, Poor people's incomes have actually declined in real terms, uh, taking into account inflation. So we're, you know, so unlike the Great Depression, in which uh, the government actually worked to redistribute income and to uh, uh, to enfranchise lower classes, then in this case, uh, the bailout did not do that. Now you could argue that well, there's some other issues involved. You know, Obama did health care, and this helped the little guy. But overall, the government's response to the, the Great Recession actually exacerbated, allowed the exacerbation of this income inequality that we're suffering in this country. So, yeah. But well, that has uh, the political other, implications, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It does. And I, you know, I think uh, uh, Americans are still angry, although I think they've, they're confused about, you know, uh, where they're pointing their anger, quite frankly. Uh, you have to beware of right-wing populism, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, something that you have to be careful about because politics is the art of persuasion. It's not the art of truth-telling, especially when Donald Trump is involved. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. But the other thing about this Great Recession is that we saw, you know, these, these uh, uh, homeowners of color, uh, Af African-American and Latino homeowners, their wealth had been going up a bit in the 1990s. Uh, the Clinton administration had put in place a, a tax credit that uh, low-income and African-American and Latinos had been able to take advantage of. 
Uh, this was basically nullified by the fact that they lost their homes and they lost a significant amount of wealth and investment. And so you actually see their uh, their wealth actually declining in the period after the Great Dis uh, Recession. So, so for minority groups, actually, they're in significantly worse shape. I mean, when you're looking at wealth, uh, uh, white people's wealth is in the range of $120,000 total wealth. And you look at uh, people of color and their wealth is in the range of $10,000 total. So this really, uh, this, this wealth gap has just increased uh, and it's, you know, I don't, I don't see any relief from that, at least not from this current administration. So how real is, uh, is Trump's claim that he's done lots for the economy and that under his administration, the economy is doing much better. Uh, and for as long as he's in office, however long that might be, um, the economy would be going great. How, how valid is that claim given yeah, what so, has happened so, after 2008? So, uh, so here, if, if we look at it in terms of inequality, then the Trump administration has dramatically exacerbated inequality. They did this with the tax package that, you know, the, the Democrats call this the tax scam, right? So the tax package included a big bonus for businesses and wealthy people and estimates have the, the, the taxes, the, the, the tax benefit going 85 percent to the wealthiest people in the country. 85% of that, I think it was $1.5 trillion is gonna to go to people who really don't need it. And those who do need it, working people, well, when you look on the tax form today, guess what's missing? It's the unreimbursed employee expenses category, which was designed for teachers and working people. That's gone from the tax form. Yeah. The Republicans took that out in a very kind of cynical move. So. So they weren't even they weren't even hiding this fact that this tax package was meant to put more money in the pocket of the rich and take money from the poor. It's and it's, the corporations, uh, yeah, right, the multinational right. corporations. Oh, no, so, it and, is true. And now you hear that the social safety net is being cut out of the budget that he just submitted right. too. Right. Well, this is so. This has been kind of the stalking horse of of Republican spending. So you usually think about Republicans as. Uh, as, uh, as folks who want to cut the budget and don't want to spend. But the, in recent decades, the Republicans have pursued a strategy where they actually want to increase the budget. And what they want to do is blow up the budget so you'll have no choice but to cut entitlements, to cut uh, Medicare and Social Security, Medicaid. And this, is, this has been their plan all along. And if they got a majority in both houses uh, and Trump is, continues as president, they will, in fact, do this. You're going to find your Social Security privatized, and you're going to find your Medicare greatly reduced. Uh, they're, they're serious about this. They've been yeah. trying to do this for two decades now. And so. I know that if John C. Calhoun was alive today, uh, he would endorse this approach. But then we would have another civil war after that. And, and indeed, <laughs> yes, we might. John, we have to keep on doing this. Uh, All right. Maybe a couple of weeks hence, we'll do it again. We'll explore some other avenue. This is so valuable yes, to know about and connect the dots. Okay, Jay, good to talk with you. Same here, John. Aloha. All right.